Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse, an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends play d and So glad to have you back for our fifth game. I'm Andy, and I'm the DM for our adventures in the world of Theros. Let me go ahead and reintroduce my friends and the players for this game. I'm Jimmy. I play Gron, verified dragon slayer. Hell yeah. Um, I'm Scala. I know what a biscuit is. I play Andromedy, a human <laughs> mage. And my name is Jeppy. I play Clix, the slayer of dragon toenails. A very important distinction. It is probably more impactful than slaying the dragon, is slaying its toenail. But hey, if you think that slaying toenails of dragons sounds cool, <laughs> Um, and you think that Great your segue. friends... <laughs> what a wild segue! <laughs> yeah, very relatable. I, I know you probably... Most people are probably like, you know what I think is cool? Dragon toenail slaying. And most of my friends would agree. Which is our way of saying, if you have friends that would love to hear about someone stabbing a toenail of a dragon, tell them about this podcast. We would really appreciate uh, you sharing and spreading the gospel of, of toenail slaying. And with that, let's have a quick recap of our last game. Led by Volkos, you continued towards Mount Velas, overcoming the elements and some elementals along the way. Finally arriving at the majestic Volcano Temple, you met with the Chosen of Perforos, who told you that the temple would be flooded with magma. Once allowed to enter, you quickly made your way through the temple, but not before encountering Petros, Perforos's own Nyxborn double, who gave Gran a new mall, and then an enormous library which Andromedy and Clix found various tomes and magical affects. Finally, the party found the innermost chamber, where two Nyx-touched dragons, guardians of this most holy site of the Forge God, stood in your path. And in this, your final trial, you were able to overpower the dragons in a harrowing encounter, and now stand before the Forge God's statue. Volkos, kind of scratching at his wounds, approaches the anvil in the center of the chamber, the room slowly rumbling around you. You guys have a moment here as he looks to all of you uh, after saying, prepare yourselves, what do you do? Gran is still breathing really heavily from this physical feat that he just did, but his breathing slows and he comes out of his rage. Very cool. Gran, roll a d6 for me. Three. As your rage settles, with just a passing blink of the eye, some of the lava in this room just very briefly looks like pools of blood rather than lava. I've got to say, the omen tables in this book are fucking good. For sure. Clicks. Clicks uh, comes down from the staircase they were perched on to attack the dragon and just gets close to the party, breathing heavily, a little scared, but doesn't really say anything, just tries to settle down. You seem injured. Here, I can help. Thank you. I lay a hand on Clix's shoulder, and you receive ten hit points back. When Andromedy puts their hand on Clix's shoulder, Clix kind of startles, but after receiving the healing, Clix gives a still curt but mildly friendly nod towards Andromedy. Sorry, Scala, that's as good as we're going to get. We're, it's a slow process, my friend. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm totally all right with it. All right, then. Volkos takes the hammer that was resting on this anvil, stretches it out, and begins swinging down. The echo of metal against stone rings throughout the chamber, and as it does, the statue, the gargantuan form of Perforos begins to react. All of the sudden, you see Volkos's eyes go bright red as if on fire, and behind him, the statue of Perforos comes to life. You all see his form, a large, muscular man, coal-hued skin, covered as if drenched at the shoulders in mutable organic bronze, a massive helm with a large centurion's crest that goes all the way down his neck and upper back, an enormous belt of gold, and his giant hammer at his side. You see the form, the god of the forge, 
brought to life in front of you as you hear his voice. Why have you come here and disturbed my work? Looking down and moving towards the platform, Volkos still hammering slowly. What do the three of you do? I'm going to kneel first of all before I speak. Clix looks to mostly Andromedy, but just over to the party and just kind of gives a like gives a face that just says, I don't know what we're doing here. One of you has to speak. K- kind of that kind of face, like I'm not talking. Gron has a very alarmed look on his face and looks to Volkos like, do something. Lord of the Forge, bronze-blooded Perforos, we come here in a dire time. The balance of the heavens is upset. The war gods clash. And I have been sent here as the voice of Clothis in search of something called Creation's Eye. As the god of creation, can you aid us? Too many have come seeking treasures and weapons out of selfish ambition, none understanding the beauty in the cycle of creation and destruction. As he speaks, the entire chamber trembles and echoes. Even my brothers and sisters endlessly pleading for my creations to help them, as you say, as they fight amongst one and other. I do not seek this creation for myself. I have been sent here. So even Clothis cannot resist sending her followers to seek boons in aid their trivial fights against their ill-gotten fates. Keeper of the flame, the damage to destiny runs deep. Destiny. Destiny. And he shouts this out, the entire room trembles. You think I don't know their impact? Was it destiny that spake for Heliod? He raises his hand and points to his head. To demand me of something he never deserved? Was it destiny that Krufix strike me down for standing against that arrogance? Was it destiny that decreed Heliod? Sink Olantin into the sea, or for Phoenix to escape Erebus's grasp and ascend into godhood? It is as I have said, the damage to destiny runs deep. Even the gods seek to defy it. Heliod has earned the displeasure of my lady as well. If so, for him, then why was it not? For Xenagos, what gives Clothis the right to know the furious Clothis? I should show them my fury. There will be a time for your fury, but now it is time for your ingenuity. Give me a persuasion roll. This will be a flat roll, advantage cancelled out by your exhaustion. Yep. Dirty 20. Okay. His shoulders relax. You see the fire red veins in his form begin to quell. A champion of Modus came here, carving a path of blood of my father right into this very chamber. He demanded I build him a weapon that could destroy Eros. I drowned him in this very lake. He points to the lava behind him. And sent him straight into Agonus. What makes your plea different, mortal? I'm no follower of Mogus. What was the name of this champion? Perforos, god of the forge, turns towards you, Gron, and says... His name was Marukios Zarak, son of Rordon known as the Rageblood. His father killed my champion once. I returned the favor in 
behind by killing his son. Gron's eyes widen, and bits of flesh on his face between his fur go pale white. I know that name. What do you know of that name? Marukios was a horrible beast, a slayer of all things, champion of Mogus, my namesake. I'll turn back to Perforos on that, and I would say, I have not come here seeking power. My name is nothing. I am a conduit, a servant. My lady asks that you help her in her task, the difficult task of restoring the order that once was. And Romani, go ahead and roll flat religion check for me. You roll this with guidance as in Volkos's semi-incapacitated state, you see his eyes flare with this red aura towards you. That's going to be a 16. Perforos bends his gargantuan form down towards you. I remember only glimpses of creation's eye. It comes from before, long ago. As he speaks, his large hand reaches out and points towards you, and the three of you begin seeing images in your minds as he is describing these things. He goes on. When the world was young, Clothis and Crufix warred against the ancient and terrible titans. She bound them to their fate, imprisoned in the underworld. Before she locked herself away with them, she wore a beautiful crown of white and gold, with wondrous gems set into it. Clicks and Gron immediately, you recognize two of these gems as the same ones you saw in your visions at the monastery. Now, instead, she hides her eyes covered to the world. The last time Vesios, the great sister mountain, erupted. You see, not the kind of constant erupting of Velus, but a terrible and catastrophic explosive eruption of another volcano. I admit to you, a secret no mortal souls remaining on this earth know. That eruption hid something from this world that perhaps should not have been hidden. Perhaps it was her absence that willed it, but... And you see different images now. Buried deep within the Ashland lies a forgotten temple to you, god of destiny. My champion at the time brought me such a crown that he found in that place as an offering to me. Not knowing of its power, I grew terribly jealous of its beauty, for I recognized its shape. And he puts his other hand back towards his head. But I knew not who created it. I demanded he return it to its resting place, and I buried it, so none may know. He takes his hand away from the three of you, and turns sideways, looking away. If she is determined to find that relic, to try and set the world back to balance, that is where it lay. I decline my head in respect, I will say. Thank you, Forge Master. For my part, I can only say that you need not be troubled with jealousy. My master does not seek to wear a crown. If she would have its power, then I can only conclude that a threat consummate to that of the Titans menaces this world now. The room slowly trembles, not in a violent way, as the way when his voice raised, but slower. All of the oracles of all of the gods of this world should pray that not be the case. He points his hand up towards one of the walls of this chamber. This temple begins flooding. Through the mines you will find a forgotten entrance to one eye pass. My current champion guards it now, 
and her temple is another day's journey north from that place. He lowers his arm, and as he does, the red doors behind all of you blow open as a gout of hot wind rushes through this space. The form of Perforos recedes back into a statue. Volkos, hammering all the while, now stops. Oh, what? Oh. He takes his head. What happened? What's happening? There will be time for that later. We should leave. The temple is about to be flooded. <laughs> oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> Very well. He makes to move for the doors. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Me too. As soon as you exit this space, you can tell that all of the forges and all of the pillars of lava that were in the large forge room are now overflowing. And indeed, the chambers of this entire temple are growing hotter as lava seeps from the walls. As you quickly make your way back to the ore processing chamber, <laughs> uh, Volkos grabs your arm, Andromedy, and says, I know my task is done now. I have brought you all before the Forge God. But if all of these omens are true, and this is the shadow we face, I must return to the monastery. I am not afraid of lava, but the three of you should make great haste from here. Take care, Sophistes. I should like to see you again. And I give him a hug. I know that we shall. And he gives you an enormous hug. Looking to Gron and Clix, good luck, my new friends. Clix gives a curt nod and starts making off. Uh, no, no interest in getting burned. It's been an honor. Gron, keep using that rage to protect your friends, and the three of you will be fine. And with that, he turns and begins jumping from minecart to table to wall to wall, monk shitting his way out of this temple as it begins to flood, leaving the three of you at the entrance to the mines. You can basically see that within like 20, 30 feet turns from beautifully constructed, artistic, museum-like temple into literal mine shafts. Uh, so I guess down into the mine we go. As the three of you descend into the caves and mine shafts below the volcano temple of Mount Velas, you consider all of the events that have taken place very quickly that have brought you together. After slaying the twin dragons in the trial of fire, coming face to face with Perforos himself, and saying farewell to Volkos, you make for One Eye Pass and the forgotten Temple of Clothis beyond. You travel past tightly winding tunnels dug deep into the earth. However, among them, there is a single, large, straight path of partially cooling molten walls that lead directly away from the temple. Everybody go ahead and give me a perception check. 17. 7. 6. Gron, it kind of dawns after you after a little while walking through this mine that when Perforos said that there was a secret tunnel, a secret entrance of some sort, he could have quite possibly just made one in that moment. And that is this giant, perfectly carved, semi-cooling chamber that you are all now walking through that cuts directly through all of this other errant winding corridors. This tunnel seems like it was just put here, doesn't it? Clicks looks to the walls and then goes back to Gron. Well, I've never seen walls that look like that. You might be right. Seems like Perforos is showing us the way. Let's just keep moving. I'm exhausted. Don't tell me about it. You continue along this path and you can tell that exhaustion might be setting in very quickly for all of you. It is quite possibly among this dimly lit and quickly becoming dark cave that it could quite possibly be the middle of the night uh, after your journey through the temple. So how do you all proceed? I'm feeling a little worse for wear, but Gron is always game. Let's keep this show on the road. Gron seems to know where he's going. I will follow. In the mines, are there like visible ore? Like, you know, is there like, are there gold nodes and stuff like that about? Uh, like some, uh, Minecraft or something. Um, go ahead and give me clicks a investigation check. Okay. That's a uh, 16. On a 16, you see some small pockets of shining metal, 
you're not sure, but to your untrained eye, it's more likely to be copper ore than anything else. Mm, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Let's keep going. Is this kind of a winding tunnel? Well, the one that you are in is a straight tunnel that has different winding tunnels that kind of crisscross it as if it's like this mine shaft was a bunch of winding tunnels but you are taking one that has been directly carved through all of the rest there are all of these little intersecting corridors at odd angles and and coming from different ways that all kind of wind back and forth away from this central tunnel that is like some Minecraft shit. Yeah, yeah, it literally is. It's like you just dug in a straight direction through a bunch of naturally occurring tunnels. So you want to press on. How are we doing? Let's just make it out of the mountain, and then we can decide how we're doing. Sounds good. And I trudge forth. So Gron, leading this party, go ahead and give me a survival check. 13. Okay. Your pace is not terribly quick. Your party is very tired, but you are able to continue along without too much issue. You can keep going, but you think if you do, then the three of you might have to either slow your pace or there would be some exhaustion checks in play. You've probably been traveling for a couple of hours at this point. Do you think it would be safe to camp here? I don't know any flood that goes this far. I don't know. I think we should try and make it under the stars. Floods can travel pretty far. Like, rivers kind of are a type of flood. Well, then why did you ask me? Let's just keep going. <laughs> so, you all keep going. I need another survival check. Take a d4 on this. That's a 12. You're definitely starting to feel worn out. Everybody give me a constitution saving throw. Well, great. Ooh, thank God. 18. <laughs> 16. 21. Okay, you all pass. Oof. You manage to stave off the exhaustion, and it is at this point that this very dark tunnel begins to have a glimmer of moonlight in the distance. There, up ahead, light. Continuing on, you come to the exit of this newly forged path. You find yourself, indeed, under an open, clear night's sky. Nyx above you, a full moon, as you step onto the side of a wide and winding gorge. You can see in this clear, bright lit night that beyond to one end you see it narrows and then empties into stark landscape beyond, and in the other end it descends slowly into steep canyons that disappear into shadow and complete darkness. But you are basically where the bottom of a mountain meets a ravine. Andromedy, you would assume that this is one eye pass. Clicks kind of falls to the ground, exasperated, and looks to Gron. You're the expert here. Is it safe to camp? Please, please tell me it's safe to camp. I'm, I'm exhausted. I sort of survey the area. Go ahead and give me survival. 21. You're pretty high up. You know it's at least safer ground than being at the bottom of this canyon. There doesn't look like there's too many ways up or down from here, so you think you could set up a, a safe enough camp. I think it'll be safe here. We'll have to set up watches. Is there stuff around to make a fire on that 21? Uh, on the 21, yes. Unlike being high in the mountains, you guys have traveled through this cave far and kind of at this constant slight incline, such that now you are kind of back more near, not near sea level, but you're not up on the top of the mountains anymore. And so there are different brush and, and small trees dotting the area. All right. Gron dutifully starts gathering up sticks and branches, and builds a campfire. All right, I'll take first watch, Andromedy, second watch, and my eyes turn to clicks. So tired. I'll take a third watch. He says, not happily. Okay, cool. Uh, do any of you, either Andromedy or clicks, do anything for going to bed? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Done. Done. Uh, nope. Cool. So that watch is going to be Gron. It's only a five. Okay. Get the fuck out of here. <sighs> yep. All right. Speeding this up. Gron... You are extremely tired and so perhaps a bit distracted. You struggle to keep your eyes open at times. Off. Through your watch, 
you don't see anything immediately around you that would be unsettling, but on the other side of the ravine, you occasionally can hear something. A low rumble or something. You, you really can't tell what it is, though. And other than that, your watch is quiet. Okay. Can I roll history? Because I'm from kind of near here, mm -hmm. and I may have been in this area, not here, yeah. but near here at some point sure. in the past. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's a 17 plus zero. On a 17, you would remember bits and pieces about One Eye Pass. Somewhere around here, there is an outpost that serves to keep an Akroan eye on a large cyclops population that roams the area. Any dangerous creatures that come from the Ashlands to the north, the mountains to the east, or the Badlands to the west are kind of defended on all sides as this narrow gorge serves as the northernmost point of kind of the Ekroan guard road or watch road that goes from Akros north all the way to this point and serves as a patrol route for Akros. Blearily remember some things about when I pass as I'm dozing. Yeah, uh, and your watch comes to an end. Mm -hmm. I gently wake up in dramedy. <sighs> okay. It's been a long day for all of us. That it has. I would like to speak to you more of this later, but your name is Gron. That's one of my names. No. Yes. Your name is Gron. And they smile, and they get up. They say, sleep well. Gron ponders this for uh, only a second before just out, just falling asleep. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Andromedy, go ahead and give me a perception check. I'm still exhausted for this, yes? You are still exhausted. Okay. Oh, man, that would have been a 21, but it's an 8. <laughs> Andromeda, you also hear something like rumbling or like the chopping down of trees, some noise, some low noise in the distance, but you have no idea what it could be. Occasionally, it comes from across the canyon. Other than that, you really can't tell. As well, your view of Nyx, while beautiful, is probably extremely distracted by all of the goings-on that have happened to you. Ron stirs. Cyclops. <laughs> the Cyclops is a one-eyed giant. Oh! Yeah, that, that does make some sense. Other than that, your watch is quiet. Eh? Oh, wait, clicks up. Clicks unhappily and dramatically <laughs> rises and stretches... Like in a the zombie classic, from his absolutely, sleep. <laughs> absolutely not like a zombie, but stretches instead like a classic cat silhouette on Halloween, um, arching its back and stretching out its little bones, <laughs> getting up, big yawn, kind of like you know coming to, um, and then just gives like a yep, okay, yeah, I'm here, fine, nod. Uh, to Andromedy, wordlessly going to start their watch. And with uh, the strength of a zero on perception, going to roll for that watch. Go for it. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Ten on the dice. Highest maybe, so far. Maybe that's enough to save us from whatever the fuck's been staring at us all night. We will see. <laughs> Clicks. With your dark vision, on a 10, you can see out past the darkness a bit, and it almost looks like there's some form of encampment on the other side of this ravine. Hmm. You can't really tell whose or what it is, but you see a very faint plume of, of smoke rising far away from the ledge of the opposite side of this canyon. You also hear this faint rumbling throughout your watch, distant. Occasionally, there is a sound that is much closer than the rest, still kind of either down in this canyon or on the opposite side. And lastly, just looking around, you would kind of be drawn to Mount Velis, which is now immediately to your back, where a large column of smoke is rising from the top of it. Other than that, your watch is quiet. Before daybreak, I need Gron and Andromedy to both roll a d6 for me. Five. Six. 
Oh, that's a really good one. We'll start with Andromedy. As you sleep, Andromedy, you toss and turn violently at times, unable to find really settled rest. And this, this comes to you especially after you take your watch. You have flashes of dreams, or maybe they're not dreams, maybe they're something else, but you can't help but feel that the course of events that you just experienced fighting dragons and standing before Perforos, as though you've experienced it before, but you have no sense of you being yourself as you're having these experiences. The final one is that of being plunged into lava, and you wake. Simultaneously, Gron, while you don't have dreams or troubled rest very much at all, when you wake, your entire vision is painted in blood red. And as you kind of blink your eyes to wear out the sleepiness, it fades but slowly, lasts about 10 seconds or so. You all wake to the morning light of dawn, and you level up to five. Yo! Excellent. Andromedy. Ba -ba 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 there it is. Andromedy uh, dropping their level of exhaustion, and everybody getting some spicy stuff at level five. And then what's my con? So that's 11. Not bad. Clicks up to 52, is that right? Yeah. Also, everybody's proficiency score goes up by one, so all mm -hmm. your proficient stuff goes up. As does my sneak attack. Yeah, five is a big level for everyone. Gron, what are we up to? 59. Must have been a, kind of a low roll. I was only a 50 less level. I, uh, I literally almost have as much health as you. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. Are you rolling the d12? I'm rolling the d12. Okay. Am I adding the... You're mm. adding four, so you rolled a five. Yeah, that's fine. Seems high for a rogue. He also has plus four to con. Oh, well, then that's what's doing. Yeah, yeah. and I just rolled a seven. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> is Entropy taking another level of wizard? Yes. Okay. Um, 39 hit points is All my right. new number. Respectable. Andromeda, you also gain two more Oracle Piety, and Gron, for getting both kills on those dragons, uh, your Piety with Mogus also goes up by two. I feel conflicted. I bet. I don't feel that I should be taking credit for those kills. So let's see, Gron gets extra attack and the wizard gets their next level of spells. Yes, I get third level spell slots, but I because of my cleric dip, I have no third level spells. I see how it works. Okay, got it. You can still upcast stuff. Yeah, you though. can fucking Correct. inflict wounds for a big old pile for, of damage. Yes, 5d10 or um, <laughs> as I'm going to probably okay. do Magic uh, Missile at fucking third level. <laughs> no, no, double cast blindness deafness at people oh yeah that's spicy. double target blindness deafness double target um actually i don't know if that one can be multi-targeted but i might multi-target levitate as well cool anyways that's just about enough mechanics as i think anybody would ever want to even listen to you all awake and you can plainly see a large cyclops walking in the canyon directly below your camp what do you all do Andromeda, do you speak giant? No, that is not one of my many languages. Okay. It is one of my few languages. Do you think this Cyclops is likely to be friendly? The tales I have read of them are mm, unsettling at the best of times. It's doubtful, but we can try better than fighting it. Clicks. You are adept at remaining beneath the notice of people. Do you think there is a way that we can remain beneath its notice? Andy, where this Cyclops is is not where I saw the campfires, right? No. That's across the way? Correct. How, how far of a gap is this ravine from one side to the other? Clicks, go ahead and give me a perception check. 15. The ravine itself is probably somewhere between 120, 150 feet across. Mm. And down, it's at least 50 or 60. So it is wider than it is deep. And this is by far the narrowest point. It widens and deepens as it goes down into dark canyons, which in the daylight are still covered in shadows. And then to the opposite side, it kind of spills out into these wastelands beyond, which you can now see in the daylight have a very thick gray haze covering the entire landscape as you look. So the Cyclops is down in the ravine kind of walking around. Also on a 15, you would see that there is a small path that kind of winds up the, the side of the cliff on the other side. You don't see one on the side that you are on, however. Uh, Clix looks over the edge of the ravine and just kind of gestures at the fact that there's no way down and just says, I don't think that's an option. Clix, just go ahead and give me a flat intelligence check. 
17 plus 1, 18. Plus 1 to intelligence? Nope, that's a 12, not a 17. Wow. What is Clicks, wrong with your dice? Clicks really went all physical stats. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, <laughs> that's still a really good roll. <laughs> Clicks, you you might just be inclined to think, just hide up here. Maybe it'll go away. That was not what Clicks was thinking a minute ago. <laughs> um, Cyclops are not known for their noticing ability. Clicks looks grown up and down and says, and you think you're going to rappel off this cliff without being noticed? Looking up and down the giant frame of Gron. Uh, we could try distracting it somehow. I mean, we're through the caves. There's no danger. I could use a nap. What if we just wait? I mean, we have a job to do here. You want to just toil away these hours? Ugh, do we though? Yes, but your point is well taken. If we put ourselves in unnecessary danger, we decrease our likelihood of, of finishing our task successfully. You a mathematician now, too? I, like, gesture at my book <laughs> and, like, open my bag and show all the books in my bag. I am a scholar. I, I study many things. And then he clicks, looks over to Gron and says, see, the scholar thinks we should nap, too. <sighs> all right, fine. Deciding to wait... Why don't the three of you go ahead and give me a stealth check with advantage because you're staying kind of up by this cave entrance. And then whoever is going to try and keep watch on this thing, if any of you, is going to roll me a perception check. 24. 17. 12. So the three of you hunker down and try to wait out this roaming Cyclops. Who's going to try and keep an eye on it? Maybe the three of you can. You rolled pretty well on that stealth check. Roll. <laughs> Two. <laughs> I'll give Gron guidance on this one. That would be much appreciated. That's a 14. You could also, uh, Andromedy, give Gron the help action, too. Yeah, let's let's do both of them. Great. All right. Oh. <laughs> nope. It's still a 14. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the first roll was a six. The second roll was a five. Gron, you watched the Cyclops for about half an hour to going on an hour, and it's just kind of walking around. It looks like it, maybe it's looking at something, looking for something. But on a 14, towards the end of that, you start to hear echoes of stomping of perhaps another Cyclops a lot closer to the three of you than that one down below. I don't know why we thought we were safe here. Me neither. <laughs> Why wouldn't we be? <laughs> because this is one I'd pass. What does that mean? This is where, oh, you don't know. Well, uh, this is where Cyclops live. I guess you do know now. There's more than one of those? Oh, yes. Gron would know. Large population. Large population. Should we just go back in the cave? But do we really need to be doing this? I mean, if you want to spend your whole life being scared and just die afraid, oh, that would be fine. You could man. do that. Man, oh, man. Oh, Worked man. out for me so far. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Clicks looks back to the cave, considers it, and then just kind of huffs and... But besides going down into the ravine, is there any sort of pathway in the direction we're headed? Give me perception, Andromedy. Well, if there is, I don't see it. That's only a seven. Yeah, you're looking around, and it's kind of just, again, like hilly base of a mountain landscape. This ravine in both directions. You could try and go to the end where the wastelands begin, but you don't see any way down. All right. Okay. Um, but, like, is there a path leading, like, wh where are we going? North? Yeah, more or less. You would be able to tell. And, and again, it's like it's these, these cliff sides just stop and, and dead drop into the landscape around. Sooner or later, we need to get from up here to down there. I say we do it sooner. Fair enough. Okay. okay. Uh, let's take the north road and see if we can find a safer crossing. <sighs> Gron goes. Gron taking the lead. Go ahead, everyone, and re-roll me a stealth check. Oh. Oh, no. 16. 19. It's a nat 1 plus 6 is 7. I don't think you rolled a nat 1 there. I think you rolled a 10. Thank you very much. Okay, You're 10 welcome. total of 16? 16. 16. Cool. That's um, a good one. That, that's a good use of your portent dice. That is a great use of your portent dice because oh, God. Andromedy, what you see is the Cyclops below the three of you don't see you at all. It rolled an at one and it has disadvantage on Farsight anyways. But you begin to trek along this kind of precarious terrain. And as you move away from the cave, you can see that there is another Cyclops wandering around above you up the mountainside. And it looks around, and for a moment, Andromedy, you think it spotted the three of you. Uh, I do a little wave of the hand, and with my hand's motion, the Cyclops' single eye turns away from near us. 
averts its gaze and keeps walking in its direction away from you. That was very close. It rolled a 15. Thank fuck. <laughs> so you continue on. Then the rogue would have blown it. Unbelievable. The rogue would have blown it. But these, these guys are still in play. Uh, you've gotten a fair distance towards the end of this ravine. I'm going to need one more before you try and figure out how you're going to get down. That's more like it. 19 on the dice, 25 total. 19. So this was my turn to roll in that one. Oh, no. And I'm debating whether I want to blow through my other portent right away. It's, it's still the morning. Yeah, I don't know. It's up to you. Got a long trek ahead of you. What's your other what's your other portent dice? It's a 19 too. Like I don't want to lose that. Oh, no. It is the beginning of the day. It's up to you. <laughs> I'm going to let it ride. 3. Okay. Oh, getting battered by a fucking cyclops in the morning. Andromedy lets it ride as the cyclops on the side of the mountain turns its gaze towards the three of you, lifts up a giant boulder, and akin to like you've seen large creatures do before, throws it in your direction. I need the three of you to make a dexterity saving throw. Seems a little unreasonable. We didn't even do anything. As it bellows <laughs> out in your direction. <laughs> Where did you come from? In giant. 18. 14. Cool. Very cool. Seven. Very cool. Uh, Andromeda, you take nine bludgeoning damage as this boulder crashes into you and then tumbles over the ravine. And roll perception check for the other giant now. The other Cyclops, the three of you notice immediately, sees that boulder fall down the canyon, but may or may not see the three of you at this point. And it's at this point, I need us to go ahead and roll some initiative. Four. Five. Nineteen. Top of initiative is clicks. Clicks, you see, at the very least, the Cyclops above the three of you is slowly making its way towards you. Before you do anything, I'm gonna need you to make a perception check, however. 16. Okay. Clicks, the very first thing you notice is the camp that you had seen before. The smoke that is rising from it becomes much stronger. Um, they may or may not have seen what's going on here, um, but you can tell that there is some activity going on across the canyon. It's your turn. Clicks turns to Gron. Any chance whatever that is over there might be friendly? pointing to the smokestacks billowing out over the distance. I have no way of knowing that. <sighs> I'm going to use my movement to... You said there's fog, but is there, like, brush around, around this canyon area now that we're off to the side of the entrance that I could hide in? Uh, with that perception check, I'll say, I'll say, yeah, you can find uh, sparse shrub or small tree. Clix is going to hide in there. Roll stealth. Uh, 16. Okay. Anything else from Clicks? Okay, I'm going to stay hidden for now rather than uh, do any bow attacks. Okay. That is the Cyclops approaching. He's going to roll Perception. Wow, these are some bad stats. Um, absolutely uh, unknowing of where whatever third figure was in front of them as they approach. Good. Uh, continues towards Gron and Andromedy. From the two of you, it's now about 20 feet away from the two of you. You see it's drawing an enormous club that it had on its back as it approaches. And that is Andromedy. Gron, what is the giant word for flea? Oh, well, that'd be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a couple of years. Hold on, it's... Um, Vamanos. <laughs> they speak Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, man? Who knows? I was just going to say, like, oh, that would be Brog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. That's good too. I look at the giant and I command it to brug. Is that a that's a will save? Uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a wisdom save. I'm so sorry, and I'll send you a picture of this. Nat twenty. Oh fuck off! Oh my god, this giant is not putting up with any. He's already been these these are not the droids you're looking for. Once he shall yeah. not be it done to him again. Poorly constructed sentence. But the sentiment remains. Uh, anything else from Andromedy? Uh, a move away from it. <laughs> We're now 50 feet away from the giant. And that is Gron. Uh, I'm going to close the distance between me and this Cyclops, perhaps unwisely, and I'm going to activate my rage. So the heat radiates from my body, singeing this Cyclops at the shin, I presume. Jesus. <laughs> uh, he takes three points of fire damage. Hey, food shouldn't do that to me. It says a giant. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I'm gonna smack him recklessly with my maul. I'm gonna aim right for his Achilles tendon. Go for it. That's a 25 to hit. That'll hit? I bet it will. That's 15 bludgeoning damage. I'm gonna hit it with my maul again. Big surprise. Okay. That is a 25 to hit. Yep. And that is going to be another 19 bludgeoning damage. Double sixes. Cool, cool, cool. That is back to the top. That's clicks. All right, I'm going to come and flank and attack Cyclops Slash. All right. Gron, you hear the Cyclops say, Oh, more food. You were hiding. It's a nat one, but thank God I have advantage. We will see. Nat 20. Nice. nice. Go for it. Go for it, go for it, go for it. Uh, Hit it in the eye. <laughs> so that's four. So that's eight on the standard attack right there, on the standard crit attack. And then uh, sneak attack, I have three now, so it's going to be six total. Six. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. Two, two, four, seven, ten, that's eleven, a nightmare. <laughs> thirteen. That was that was six, right? Or was that five? I don't know. Twenty-three total is what we're going with. All right. <laughs> Go ahead and roll the offhand. Nope. Uh, does a fifteen hit? Fifteen will just hit. All right, cool. Yeah, so Clicks gets like a running start and runs up the Cyclops' leg and like stabs it kind of in the ass cheek with both main <laughs> hand and off hand. Um, oh, my ass cheek. Three. Every point counts. Every point counts. You guys are nowhere close on this thing. Fuck. As it, it looks down and clicks on its ass and Gron at its feet goes, my turn, and makes two attacks. Jesus. 15 plus mod on clicks. Yeah, no, it's and hits. 10 plus mod, which is a 19 total on Gron. Yep, fuck. No. That's 23 damage to clicks. Reasonable. Uh, I'm going to throw myself in front of that one. Okay, you jump up using your reaction. So yeah. that's badass. What does that look like? I see this Cyclops winding up with his club. He's about to swat clicks. Yeah. Tiny little bug. And I just instinctively throw my body in between clicks and the club. And the club just fucking batters me. Yeah, so, well, you're raging. So half of that is going to be 12 damage. Um, and then this second swing, which was on you, he swings down again, and that is 26, halved to 13. So I took no damage? Uh, correct. Don't hurt my friend, I say in giant. Clicks can't understand it, so he does not react. <laughs> he wouldn't have reacted anyway. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Andromedy from behind you over the cliffside. You can see that indeed the other Cyclops has noticed this fight take place and is beginning to climb up the side of the canyon. That is your turn. We're kind of in a fight now, so I suppose I will try and attack it. <laughs> a little bit in a fight. I think I'm gonna shoot uh, a Ferrica's acid arrow at it. Oh shit. Uh, at third level. Nice. Screw Melf. Who's that guy? I don't know. Somebody who's never been to Theros. Uh, so that's going to be a 17 plus uh, 7. So a 24 to hit. Yep. Uh, the Cyclops will take 5d4 acid damage. So that's going to be 10, 11 points of acid damage. Okay. And, and then on the end of its turn, it's going to take more. I think that is all I can really do now. That is Gron's turn. All right. I'm going to... Uh, who am I kidding? I'm going to hit it. <sighs> I don't know if I, these need to be reckless. That's <laughs> that's a 26 to hit. Yep. And oh, this time it's only going to be 11 bludgeoning damage on that first attack. Oh, only 11. Okay. Yep. As I'm just wailing away at its shins. That one didn't hurt that much. Oh, no. And the next one is going to be another 25. Yep. 15 bludgeoning damage. Cool. And it's too big for me to push it. It is huge. And Clix is too close for me to burn it, so my turn is over. Cool. That goes back to the top. That is Clix's turn. You've just narrowly escaped this giant club as Gron has leaped up to your defense. Doing the thing. 14. Uh, 16. 16 will hit. Sick. 7 damage, and then we'll add sneak attack an additional seven. Okay. This thing looks hurt, but it does not look bloodied. 
Okay. I love the idea of this cowardly cat trying to daunting roar a whole ass cyclops. Okay. So what I'm the gonna fuck use is this? I'm gonna use my <laughs> bonus action to do daunting roar, a lean okay. and passive. Um, a, the uh, cyclops needs to make a wisdom saving throw, else be feared until the end of this turn. There's no size limit on that. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, what's the DC on that? The 15 is the DC. Oh, shit. That's very cool. And with a minus two to its wisdom, it rolls a 16 minus two. That's oh. a fail. Oh. <laughs> clicks, uh, clicks roars, but looks absolutely unsure of himself while doing so. And what does that sound like? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, come on, oh, that's what it sounds like now. Good luck editing no, that. No, no. <laughs> um, I know. Actually, I'm, you have to scare a whole fucking cyclops. Yeah, I know. Clix is petrified. He's literally pissing himself while doing it. I stand by the roar. I stand by the roar. <laughs> All right. Clix stands by the roar. This cyclops, <laughs> this whole ass cyclops, looks down at you. It like it's one eye, just like super confused, and a giant. He just mumbles like you. He, he is feared mechanic, mechanically. <laughs> That's as good as Clix is going to do on the fear front. Just, just kind of like, stay, just kind of takes a step back, giant fucking step back, and goes, you. And, uh, well, it's its turn now. <laughs> Cyclops going to swing down. It's feared, so apparently with disadvantage. <laughs> Here's one swing. Still a 16 and a 17. <laughs> That's gonna hit Gron. He's so scared. I mean, why would, he wouldn't. He wouldn't fuck with this. Because that's only a two plus nine. Uh, misses clicks. But Gron taking another twenty-two damage, halved to eleven. All right. I'm gonna use my reaction to take an attack of opportunity using my Sentinel feet because it attacked clicks. Nice. Go for it. And that is gonna be a twenty-six to hit. Yeah. Fifteen bludgeoning damage on its toes. Cool. Starting to starting to, to, to look pretty hurt now. You can see it's got a bunch of fucking bludgeoning wounds. You keep hitting it with this maul. That was its turn. All right. It takes another eight points of acid damage. Yeah. Yes, it does. I don't feel so good. Uh, it's <laughs> kind of starting to, to lose its balance a little bit. Andromedy, behind you, you can see the other one has climbed all of the way up the canyon and is behind you, still pretty far away. It has picked up a boulder, though, <laughs> and is approaching. That is Andromeda. The giant word for drop, as in drop that giant boulder, is dunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I would do that, but it's 100 feet away, and the range of command is 60. Clicks, have you taken any damage yet? No. Okay, then I'm just going to cast a heroism on you. Special moth delivery, and then you can use your reaction to attack the giant again. 22 hits. Yep. Five damage. Damage is damage. Yeah. You just hate to see ones. On, 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 on. That was Andromedy's turn. It is Gron's turn. Gron winds up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm starting to feel a little hurt, but I'm still feeling like I want to just keep attacking recklessly until this thing is a smoldering heap. That's a crit. Okay. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah. There it is. Hell fucking yeah. Hell fucking yeah. <laughs> All right. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh-oh. It's the lowest roll I could possibly get with my new shiny mall. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Anyway, that fucking sucks. <laughs> That's 15 bludgeoning damage. On a crit. On a crit. Ugh. Well, I have another attack. Let's see if I crit again. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> 17. 17 will hit. Gron, I can tell you, go ahead and roll damage, but modifiers alone, this attack will kill this Cyclops. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 14 more bludgeoning damage. Absolutely. Paint us a picture. A giant bloody picture. All right. So I'm getting the hang of this extra attack thing, attacking twice in quick succession. I hit him on the ankle with my maul, sweeping out his leg. Oh. And as he loses his footing, I bring it right down in still the middle of his shin because I'm short compared to him and just crack right through it. You break his legs as he tumbles down. I was gonna eat you guys. As he tumbles down <laughs> and falls off the side of the cliff, dead. Oh, all right, great. 
there is another Cyclops approaching. A whole another ass Cyclops as we go back to Glix. Probably move away from it, yes? I mean, can we just run from this fucking thing? I think so. I think that's not unreasonable. Yeah. I- Let's go down the mountain. You're going to get to a point where you have to find a way off this cliff. Because it goes it goes up until it drops into the wastelands. Which means we're going to need to be... Yeah, okay. Clix turns back in the direction of the Cyclops and readies his dagger and sword and then runs back in the bush that he hid in earlier. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Go ahead and give me a stealth check. <laughs> Um, does a 16 do it? Maybe. We'll see. It's fucking better. That is the Cyclops' turn. It approaches, only rolling a 7 on the dice with disadvantage as it tries to chuck this boulder at Andromedy, missing. Andromedy, it's 60 feet away from you and closing. However, before you have a moment to react, all of you see... Some wild ass shit. All of you see a giant great axe made of fire come whirling out of the sky behind the Cyclops and plunge straight into its body and then explode. The Cyclops falls in an instant, a heap of fire and burned carcass standing on a ridge behind this cyclops, you see a man with dark gray skin like death, but whose body is covered in intricate bronze work and literal starlight. His two eyes beneath his bronze helm glowing like fire itself. Andromedy, you kind of recognize this form. It's on a lot of artwork in Akros. He yells out with a grunt as a robed figure rises up next to him with spectral fiery wings and shouts out, Who are you who travel so far from the realm of men and mortals? What do you all do? I I look to Andromedy with like a, do you know this guy look? Andromedy uh, offers a courtly bow. Clicks in the middle of that, hops out of the bush and just points to the other corpse and says, We killed that one for you. (laughs) The same figure, wings still burning behind them, says, And we killed this one for you. What of it? Click starts to lower back down into the bush. (laughs) Are you friend or foe? We should be asking the same of you who travel these dangerous roads. Where did you come from? The other man saying nothing, but looking on with burning eyes. We have come from Mount Velos. We are friends of Perforos, and to those who serve him, and friends to Akros, if that still means anything to you. And and friends to Clothis, too, right? Well, yes, but that's that may not be relevant here. <laughs> <laughs> the man with fire in his eyes grunts, while the other figure, who's stepping forward, you can see, is now a female centaur, whose spectral wings slowly fade from her figure. She bows back in Andromedy as we obviously exit initiative, and says, I see. Then to you, I am Adrastea, the right hand of Anax, hardened in the forge. Ron doesn't know what any of that means. <laughs> Clicks, you would loosely know Anax was the most recent king of Akros who died in war. Andromedy, you would know that and also all of the stories that come with him. But Andromedy, you know, or at least you knew up until this very moment that he died in single combat. How do you all react? Does this help us? Gron, you would at the very least be fucking intimidated as hell by, by how he brought that down with one hit. I'm kind of actually in awe. Are these guys on our side? I believe so. Anax was once the king of Akros, but he was killed. It seems that Perforos has reforged him to his own purposes. Well, I mean, as of last night, it seems like our purposes and Perforos's purposes are one and the same. I agree. So it can be safely assumed they are on our side. So let's go. Adrastea, do you know the safest way to cross this pass? <laughs> From this side, you all really are far afield, aren't you? Please, allow me to take you to our camp. And she raises her hand into the air, and a red, fiery, spectral portal appears in front of the three of you. If you will, this doesn't last that long. You trust this? I I give a nod. 
All right. You first. All right. I first. All right. I follow right behind Andromedy. Clicks hesitantly follows as well. The three of you step through what looks like literal fire, but as you pass through it is indeed a portal through space that brings you to the other side of the canyon, where you find yourself in a modest but very well-fortified hoplite camp. Following directly behind you is Adrastea herself, but the portal closes, and instead, this figure, identified as the living Anax, hardened in the forge, simply crouches, like, three-point Iron Man style, and jumps from the other side of the canyon. This right hand turns to you and says, Welcome to our modest camp. You are now among the Spears of Anax, his most holy of champions, that of the God of the Forge. And we are his elite hoplite troop, the only ones living who know that he still walks this earth. You tell us that you are on a mission from Clothis and Perforus. Where do you intend on going? There is a temple buried in the Ashlands. It is there that we must travel. You can see that there are four other figures that begin kind of slowly coming out of tents in this camp. They all wear um, modest but very decorated hoplite gear, and all of their shields, which they have on their backs, have a flaming spearhead as its symbol. An older man with a short graying beard and very short-cut hair says, You wish to seek death out in the Ashlands? What could possibly lie out there? An object of import to my goddess. <laughs> Your goddess? Adrastea turns to him and says, Now, Xenon, I have seen them in battle, and I know their intentions. They seek the lost Temple of Clothis, it seems, on a mission, perhaps, of grave importance. Another of these hoplites speaks up and says, lowering a hood from a robe, revealing a bald head and somewhat familiar bronze and red tattoos. <laughs> Well, if I didn't know it, this party would soon up rather dead than face the half-dead men and demons that lie in the wastes. What makes you think you're strong enough? He says, turning to the three of you. We killed that Cyclops back there. I was watching from my fire. Looked like your Minotaur friend did most of the fighting, empowered if not by your oracle's magic. What of you, Leonin? Did you hear me yell? <laughs> Is that what it was? Charming. Now that's... Plex has bravery and cunning sufficient to the task. If not, the god of destiny would not have chosen him. Destiny? That the pitch you gave to Perforos? Yeah, I bet it is. He looks down and there's a flash of red in his eyes as he looks into a small campfire. Um, we, we fled the, the, the siege of Akros. There is a force of Minotaur and giants there, the like of which has not been seen in years since, well... Since it was thought your king died. At that point, Anax himself lands in the middle of this scene. A echoing rumble on impact. He rises, red still burning in his eyes. The figure who is seated in front of the fire rises and puts a hand on Anax's shoulders. And you see his eyes go red as well, but softer as he says... Our champion is no longer king of that polis. His mission is here, as you have said, for darker forces, even than that of what lay waste to that place, lie out here in the corners of the world. We serve to stand against them, not the minotaurs that... And he looks kind of off-puttingly towards Gron, but then back towards Andromedy. The minotaurs that would seek to sack that place if they had the power. If this is your place, then I will not question it. But the polis faces a grave challenge. It may have need of heroes. When you say that last bit, Anax kind of turns his head, and you can really only hear one word from his grunting. Saimid! Saimid! I understand. Hedrastea, also still in this scene, looks at the other two and says, Now then, Rixenor, let's not give our captain any cause for aggression. Andromeda, just go ahead and give me a intelligence check. It brings up that name. If this is a history check, it would be a 22. You would definitely recognize the name Rexenor. It is one that Volkos has probably brought up at least a couple of times. You know this is a former flame speaker of the monastery, who certainly wasn't there while you were ever there. Notable alumnus. Yeah. She goes on saying, 
Now then, if you truly seek to brave the Ashlands, then let us offer you these warnings. Beware of the Felhide Minotaurs that call the caves out there their homes. And beware the shadow of wings, what may be the last thing that you ever live to see. The temple wasn't the only thing that Perforos meant to bury out here in this blasted land. Anything else? I've heard all that before. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen Returned before, but there are quite a lot of them out there. That and other undead. Anybody who wants to can go ahead and give me a history check. Well, dang, 26. Andromedy, you know that when they talk about undead or quote-unquote half-dead people, that they could be referring to the myths that here seem to be confirmed as much more than myths of the people who were sort of cooked and buried alive Pompeii-style out here in the Ashlands, where the eruption from Vesios was so violent and so fast that many people still wander these wastes in confusion and alarm as if they are constantly reliving that event. There are spirits in the waste, ill at ease from their violent demise. It would be best to avoid them. I thank you for your assistance, but if you have nothing else but warnings uh, to give us, I think it best we be on our way. Rexenor steps forward towards you and says, Oh, come now. I was just about to make us lunch. I think you better stay and get some rest a moment before you trudge out into the ash. I said if you had nothing to offer us beside warnings, but if you offer your hospitality, then we shall accept. Ah, I knew I smelled a former resident of the monastery among you. Now that's more like it. Volko spoke very highly of you. <laughs> that's a lie, but thanks anyway. The three of you uh, share a modest but warm meal, and you can tell as the other very powerful beings of this elite hoplite group pour over this fire that this meal is quite a bit more powerful than a simple meal. If you stay here and use about an hour's worth of time on your travel, you will be provided with the benefits of a hero's feast. Ah, oh, damn. I mean, it's a yes for me. You gain immunity to poison and fear. All wisdom saves you make gain advantage. And your maximum number of hit points increase by 10. These effects last for 24 hours. This also counts as a short rest. Just looking at this, while the three of you have this rest in this camp, the members of this troop share the meal and go about their business. But you would certainly notice the figure of Anax himself, who does not eat, does not really interact with anyone other than this former flame speaker, Rexenor, and is just on constant vigilance as he looks out towards the billowing, shadowed canyon that lies to the south of One Eye Pass. Rexenor would turn to you after a little while and say, I'm honestly surprised that Volkos would even remember me. It was so long ago that I left the monastery after being called by the voice of Perforos in my mind to serve my new purpose. I'm pleased he still lives. He said of you that you had a gift, strong like your temper. <laughs> now that sounds about right. Well, I'm sure he's doing a fine job. I never did really take to running that place. Sure, a finer job than I ever did. Those were, well, I was about to say darker days, but it seems the ones ahead may harken back to that time when the satyr sought to rise as a god. Strange times all around indeed, as he looks back into the fire. Strange times. Andromeda, you would know that for him to be alive during the war against Xenagos, he would have to be very old. Hmm. Besides him and Andrastea, there was one more person. Xenon. Go ahead and roll history on that. Uh, 19. Okay. You would remember the tale of Kytheon. Okay. One of his band was named Xenon. And since that name has kind of been popular to give young boys as sort of a, a new birth name if they show promise as a warrior. Okay. And as you're looking about, Andrastea, who is a centaur, looks... 
you know, younger than middle age, but the rest of them do all kind of look to be in their 50s or 60s or older, but still very good shape, very, you know, martially trained, thoroughly disciplined. Maybe they all could have been alive. Maybe perhaps some of them were very young. And certainly, certainly for Adrastea to be casting that level of magic, you know that she is a high level caster. But regardless, uh, after the end of this rest, the rest of the guard rises around you and Adrastea steps forward as Anax, still vigilantly watching the surroundings. She says, good luck to you. May you find the destiny that your god has planned. May it bring us all a step closer to a balanced world. As it is meant to be. So it shall. And they bid you farewell. I will say, as she says this, she also offers you two small, look like potions, vials. Uh, these are healing potions. I feel like we should give one to Clix and, and Gron each because I can heal on my own. Don't mind if I do. All right, I hand them to my friends. Thanks, friend. And you set out from this side of One-Eyed Pass, which indeed has a small path that leads down the cliff face and towards the Ashlands beyond. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake and May. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.